Uh, welcome everyone to the second talk uh, of the seminar. Uh, so uh, Renaud Rakepas uh, will speak on entropy production and on degenerate diffusions. You know. Thanks, Dima. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for attending. Uh, so indeed, I will talk about entropy production in the context of non-degenerate diffusions. And uh, more precisely, I'll be interested in large time asymptotics and small noise asymptotics. So I'll make precise what I mean by that. So the plan of the talk is the following. First, I want to give uh, some sort of general introdu introduction to entropy production because it's, it's not uh, necessarily common knowledge, uh, but also because the, the way in which I will think about entropy production in this talk uh, might not be the most usual one. So I'll use an approach which, to my knowledge, was put forward by uh, and Seiringa, which is based on hypothesis testing. So, so basic questions from, from the point of view of statistics. Okay, there are other definitions and other approaches to entropy production. Um, they are related. We'll, we'll see a bit uh, of the connection later during the talk, but I first want to give at least one, you know, general introduction to entropy production, assuming essentially nothing. Okay. Then I'll talk about the setup in which I will study entropy production, namely non-degenerate uh, diffusions. I'll present the key questions that I will be asking about entropy production. And once that's done, then I can more clearly state the, the hypothesis on which, under which I will work and uh, hopefully state my results and give some hints of uh, proof sketches. Okay, so all of that is based on a paper which is posted on the archive. Uh, so Although entropy production is a common theme in the research that I do, it's actually the only paper with the word entropy production. Um, the words entropy production in the, title, in the title, so it should be pretty easy to find. So let's let's start with this sort of general introduc introduction to entropy production. And I want to do that through a, a mini game. So I'm telling you that I have this uh, black rectangular surface here uh, that's essentially friction, frictionless. And I have two red pucks that I uh, positioned at random, so according to some uniform measure on this rectangle. Um, and I also gave them random initial velocities. So I chose the angle uh, uniformly on the circle, and I, and I gave the, the you know, speeds uh, between, say, one meter per second and two meters per second. And now um, I'm asking you to guess if this or this is the original movie that I shot. Right? There's one movie which is original. It's what happened when I did that procedure, and the other one has been reversed. Now, um, because it's a, it's, a, it's a situation with no friction, um, no loss of energy during collision, it's very hard to guess which one is the original and which one uh, is not original. Uh, but that's not true for all physical phenomena. For example, if I take a, a tub of water, okay, so I put water in a glass container, and I put that container on a hot plate, a, hot, a plate which is very hot in, in the center. Okay, so that would be the center of the plate here. Uh, and I ask you if this or this is the original movie that I shot. Now it's a bit easier, right? If you have some experience with um, such systems, if you know um, a bit of fluid dynamics, a bit of thermal dynamics, you know that uh, once the water at the bottom of the plate gets hot, it has a tendency to go up. Okay, now it goes up, it gets cooled down, and it sort of, it, it gets out of the way for new hot water uh, that's, that's coming up, and it creates this convection current. Okay, so with this idea in mind, this movie, right, where there's a circulation like this, is much more likely to be the original one than this one. Okay, so there are physical phenomena in which you can clearly tell which way time is going, and other phenomena where you, you essentially have no clue at all. So if I want to put mathematical objects on, on this mini game that we're playing, um, the objects would be the following. You, you would need a way of setting initial conditions in your system. So I will use a probability measure on, on some space. So that's how I sample initial conditions. I have a time interval. So that's the length of, of the movies that I'm showing you. And now the physical time evolution, right? the laws of nature, uh, together with this randomness in, in the initial condition, they induce a probability measure on uh, the different types of movies that you can see, okay? 
So in the case that we'll be seeing later on, uh, PT will be a measure on the space of continuous function from the interval zero T to RD. So RD is where, you know, a particle lives. So continuous functions from uh, the interval zero T to RD, they're just trajectories in that space. And there, there's a measure on such trajectories. And finally, to make, to complete the game, I need a way of reversing movies. Okay. So in the setup that we will be looking at, uh, reversing movie just means going backwards through the curve. So if the curve is uh, gamma zero and then the, the parameter t increases until gamma one, gamma two, and then gamma big T, then a reversal of the curve is just gamma big T, gamma big T minus one, gamma big T minus two, uh, and then the parameter goes down to, to gamma zero. In other physical situations, you might have to uh, tweak your time reversal a bit so that it satisfies important physical symmetries, but for, for, for us, that will be sufficient as a notion of time reversal. And now in the language of statistics, uh, this game that we're playing, it's called hypothesis testing. I give you what's called a sample. So I give you a curve and I ask, okay, was, was this sampled from the distribution P, the distribution here, or was it uh, sampled from P composed with theta inverse uh, that I will just call P reversed for sure. Okay, so there's a sample gamma. I ask, is gamma coming from P? Is it an original movie? Or is it coming from P composed with theta inverse? Is it a reversed movie? So if I were to make more precise the ways in which I would keep scores uh, in some big tournament of us playing that game, and if I gave you access to online resources or textbooks and statistics, um, you would soon figure out that, you, that your best bet is the following. Uh, what you should do in order to guess, right? You're given a movie, you're given a curve. What you should do is look at the Radon-Economy derivative between P and P reverse, evaluate that in gamma, and take the log and make your decision based on the sign. So why the sign? Well, if the log is non-negative, it means that what's inside is at least one, meaning that the density of P at the point gamma is at least as big as the density of P reversed at the point gamma. So it makes sense that gamma would be an original path, right? Gamma as a path is more likely, is more typical for P than it is for P reversed. And conversely, conversely, if the log is negative, it means that the ratio is smaller than one. So gamma is more typical for P reversed than it is for P. So that's, we're playing that game. I show you movies, I ask, are they reversed or not? And that, that's your strategy, okay? And uh, this quantity, this log of the radon economy derivative, that is what I will call entropy production in what follows, okay? So this is one way to defining, uh, this is one way to define entropy production in classical systems. And I will say that this game that we're playing, it is easy if when you follow the strategy, uh, the rate at which you're wrong, decays exponentially fast as you get access to longer and longer movies. Um, so think of the first situation with the, with the two red pucks. Uh, if I give you access to a seven hour movie of them just bouncing around and keep going, you know, they, they do that and so on and so on. Uh, if there's really no friction and no dissipation, um, you have no chance of, of guessing. Uh, I mean, you have 50, I mean, you'll be right half the time essentially. Uh, and that doesn't that doesn't that doesn't decay. Sorry, the, that the rate at which you're right doesn't improve, so the rate at which you're wrong does not decay. Um, whereas in, in the second situation with the water tank, if uh, I give you access to a very short movie, then it's hard to sort of tell a statistical fluke from a, a, a sort of clear convection current. But as you get access to longer and longer movies, you become more and more confident uh, about your prediction. Okay, and now, this, just, just trying to look at the, the laws of physics, right, the equations of motion, and asking, uh, will that game be easy or not? That's only one question uh, among many uh, question uh, about the hypothesis testing of the arrow of time. Okay? That's what it's called, because you're, you're trying to guess which way time goes. So it's called the hypothesis testing of the arrow of time. And deciding if the game is easy only is only one question in which this quantity that I introduced, uh, entropy production, is uh, very important. So now the setup. Okay, I'm not going to talk about uh, entropy production for general dynamics. I'll look at a specific class of dynamics, namely non-degenerate diffusions. So uh, a non-degenerate diffusion will be a stochastic differential equation. So if you just uh, forget that term here for a moment, it's just an ODE, right? It tells you that dx over dt is given by some vector field at the point x. Um, and now the way I've 
right? A diffusion in general would just be the axis a vector field applied to x dt plus something times uh, the derivative, the d of a Brownian motion. Um, but the way in which I write things suggests a physical picture, okay? So the physical picture that's underlying this equation is that you have a particle x, okay? It's in a, it's in a potential landscape v, so it has a tendency to follow the gradient, minus the gradient of the potential. Uh, it's also affected by some other force, which is not necessarily the, the gradient of the of a potential. There is noise, there is friction, and uh, the small is so negligible compared to the friction that really uh, the equation that you get is not the acceleration is proportional to the force, but the velocity is proportional to the force. So that's my equation here. This You think of this as a velocity, this has a force, and this has noise or thermal fluctuations. Okay. And so if you have an equation like, like this and you have an, an initial condition for the process, um, that, induce, that induces a law on the space of continuous function from zero t to r d for any t, okay? And so the, these laws, they're consistent. So it, it actually, you know, we can get a, a law p that sort of includes all the information for all, all the different t's. And now, right, uh, because of the noise actually, uh, this radon equilibrium derivative makes sense because the measures are, are uh, mutually absolutely continuous. So I can define entropy that way, entropy reduction that way, right, as the log of the radon equilibrium derivative, just like I did. And it's the key quantity that you should look at when you're trying to guess, uh, when you're asking questions about the irreversibility of the dynamics. More precisely, uh, if, you're, if you're asking about things like how the, the, the rate at which you're wrong decays and things like that. What, what matters is the large T properties of uh, the probability of some events like this. So the event that um, the time average entropy production falls in some set. Okay, so understanding quantities like that very well for T large um, allows you to answer quite a few questions on the irreversibility of the dynamics. Okay, so what, what, what kind of knowledge would we want to have about such function? So the first level, right, the sort of first basic question would be, well, can I find a number m, which I would call the mean, such that the probability that the time average density production falls far from the mean uh, goes to zero? Okay, so no matter what delta is, the probability that I'm outside of all of radius delta around m, uh, that probability goes to zero. So that's a convergence in, in measure to, to the mean. And I call that a law of large numbers. Now, a finer level would be, okay, I know that whenever I put here a set which does not contain um, the mean in its interior, the probability goes to zero, but I can ask uh, how fast do such probabilities go to zero, okay? And um, that's, that's, that information is contained in, in what we call the large deviation principle. So a large deviation principle, okay, is, about finding a function i such that these probabilities that goes to zero, that go to zero, um, when you look at the log and one over t and take the limit, you can bound that in terms of that the function that the values that that function i takes on the interior of the set, of the set and you can bound the limb soup uh, in terms again of the values that that function takes, but now on the closure of the set. So uh, an LDP is a statement about the, the uh, rate of decay of the probability of certain events as t goes to zero. And uh, if I want to go back to this, this sort of basic question, is, it, is the game easy or not? Uh, strict positivity of the mean typically uh, is, is related to easy games, okay? So to non-equilibrium phenomena. So I told you I'm working with, with some uh, non degenerate diffusion. So in that context, people had looked at entropy production before. So I wanted to give you an idea of, of what was known. Okay. So to my knowledge, whenever people would look at equations like this, uh, they will ask that V grows uh, at least quadratically at infinity. And that's just because if V grows, then the gradient of V points, sorry, minus the gradient of V points towards the center. And so it prevents a lot of pathological behaviors like es escape of uh, escape to infinity and things like that. So it enters um, some stability properties and it enters that um, 
for example, that there's a, a unique invariant measure for, for, for the process. Okay, so an LDP was obtained by Bertini and Jesu in uh, the case where B, this non-conservative part, right, this part that does not come from a gradient, is bounded and orthogonal to grad B. So that's a special case that was looked at. And another special case that was looked at was the case where this V, it's exactly quadratic and this V is linear. So if V is quadratic, then uh, minus grad V is a linear vector field. B is a linear vector field. So what you have is a linear equation. And then uh, you have a lot of tools available to study entropy production. And so uh, as a corollary of things that the XHP and Shirikan have done, in 2017, you get a large number, a lot of large numbers, and an LDP uh, with a rate function that has some nice properties because it can be computed in terms of um, quite simple matrix equations. Okay, so in the linear case, you, your your equation just involves matrices. There's a way of writing an equation, uh, a matrix equation involving these these matrices, and just by solving this matrix equation, you get the rate function essentially. So that's a nice special case. So now my contribution in this paper that I told you about is to enlarge the class of V and B nonlinear for which you can prove a law of large number in an LDP. Okay, so that's that's in some sense the technical part of the paper. Uh, and, and the new conceptual part of the paper is a study of uh, what happens to the rate function. Okay, so, so the, the way in which uh, fluctuations of entropy production are suppressed when you take away the noise when you take that parameter here to zero. So maybe first remark, if, if you just delete that term, okay, you, you set it to zero, then uh, you'll have trouble uh, making sense out of the game because um, right, all trajectories of this equation, they just go down the potential well, while all reverse movies go up the potential well. And so uh, essentially any time, you're playing the game, uh, there's no uncertainty in the game. So the two measures, the measures of movies and of reverse movies, there's, they're, they're, they're mutually singular. So you can't talk about the, the radon academic derivative and you can't do the quantitative, quantitative, and anal quantitative analysis, okay? So it's really this D that allows us to really compare um, the forward and backward trajectories. And I'm asking, okay, but what happens when D is very, very small? So say I want to focus on the LDP. So I want a large deviation principle for entropy production. The first question to ask is what are the, the tools that these people have used and that have been used in the, the realm of probability theory for quite a while uh, that, that I can use too, okay? So the first main probabilistic tool is the gartner ellis theorem. And what the gartner ellis theorem is, is one of many theorems in uh, the study of large deviations, which relate one over t, the log of the moment generating function of your random variable. So this is, you, you, there are many ways you can call this. You can call this one over t, the log of the two-sided Laplace transform, or you can call this one over t, the cumulant generating function, or uh, some people will call the limit the pressure function. Okay, so this, this quantity here on the right hand side has many names, but what the, the gartner ellis theorem tells you is that if this as t goes to infinity converges, okay, then you have a large deviation and defines a continuously different uh, differentiable function of, of the parameter alpha, then you do have a large deviation principle Okay, in the sense that you can bound the limb and find the limb soup of sets that look like this. Um, and in this correspondence, right, between moment generating function and large deviations, um, when you can do this only close to, to alpha equals zero on this side, you get uh, a large deviation principle, which is valid for sets E, which are near the mean and uh, the rate function that you obtain in the large deviation principle is, is, is just the Legendre transform of this limit. Okay. So that's the first probabilistic tool, which just tells me if I want to study large deviations of entropy production, one thing I can do is just try to understand the moment generating function of entropy production. 
Renault, and a kind of very naive question. So uh, on the right, you have kind of a Laplace transform, right? So this reminds me a little bit of heat kernel asymptotics in, uh, in spectral theory, which are very, very good for, study, for studying kind of uh, first term in the asymptotic behavior of something, you know, as some parameter is growing. But, uh, if, uh, but if you want to study maybe the corrections to the leading behavior, like remainder and so on, then Fourier transform sometimes is better than Laplace transform. So uh, is, there, is there some corresponding you know, counterpart here? It's like the wave trace is better than the heat trace, but this is on the, in the spectral theory side with which I'm a little bit more familiar the, the, than this. But, but again, this is a very naive question coming from just some yeah, and analogy. I'm a little less familiar with <laughs> with another area, but but yeah. but uh, this is just a thought. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so it turns out if if the limit uh, this limit admits an analytic extension uh, near zero, then of course you can relate that to the Fourier transform, and maybe uh, that's the kind of thing you're 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 looking for. I don't know. Okay. Thank you. you uh, Okay, so Gartner Ellis theorem says uh, if I want to understand large deviation, one thing I can do is just understand the moment generating function. Okay, now there's a second probabilistic tool, which is that uh, when you have a diffusion, so the solution to some kind of random equation uh, that I was talking about, computations of expectations that look like this, so a function of the endpoint and then an exponential of an integral that depends on the path, but that integral is in dt. Um, knowing about this is the same as solving a PDE. Okay, and that in that PDE, this endpoint, uh, this function here that cares about the endpoint, it appears as an, in, as an initial condition. This integrand here, it appears as a um, potential, if you wish. In, in the PDE, and uh, this now there's also now this operator, which is a second order differential operator, which is essentially the the what characterizes the underlying diffusion. Okay, so Gernot Ellis says if you want to under if you want to understand large deviations, you maybe what you want to do is understand moment generating function, and what Feynman Cat tells you is that if you can write your moment generating function in, in a way that looks something like this, then you can use PDE tools to talk about your moment generating function, okay? which is the route that has been used before and I, that I will use also. So again, uh, I mean, these theorems, they have actual conditions. Uh, so it so gets a bit technical, but that's the general idea. So to, to actually use them, I need to put more assumptions. Okay, So what are my hypotheses and results? As I said, I work with, uh, with the diffusion and when I, by the way, when I say non-degenerate diffusion, it means that this matrix here that I had was a uh, full rank. Okay, so uh, before it was matrix D, now I went even a bit further and I just assumed that it's a, a constant. Now I'm calling that constant um, two epsilon because it's convenient for formulas and because later on I'll take epsilon to zero and it's more natural to take epsilon to zero than half D to zero. Anyway, um, so the assumptions I'll, that I will be working on, uh, working with, are the, the following. So as I said, I, I need to ask that V grows nicely at infinity. So it's just to prevent uh, things from escaping. Uh, this B, I will allow it to not only be bounded, but maybe uh, unbounded as long as it's globally Lipschitz. And I will ask that it does not interfere with the behavior of minus V, minus nabla V at infinity. Right, I told you I need V to grow because I want na minus nabla V to point towards the origin. Now, if B is exactly opposite or stronger in the other direction, then I don't have this confining property anymore. So I want to avoid that. And uh, finally, I will ask that V is a finite set of critical points and that all these critical points, they're non-degenerate in the sense that if you look at the Hessian uh, of V in, in each critical point, you get a non-full uh, rank matrix. And I will also ask that B preserves the structure of the critical points. So meaning that if a point is a local min of V, right, then it's a stable fixed point of minus nabla V, and I want it to still be a stable fixed point of minus nabla V plus B. Okay. 
right? So those are the assumptions I'll be working on. Uh, you can check, right, that these assumptions, if V is always bounded and orthogonal to V, they're satisfied. Okay, so as I said, a special case was already known. And the picture that I want you to keep in mind is the following, right? What's happening in this process is that you sample an initial condition according to some measure, maybe say you start here, then what the first term in the equation makes you want to do is go down the gradient of the potential. Okay, I, here I plotted the level sets of the potential. Uh, but then there's this B that makes you deviate a bit, and there's this small brown in motion that makes you, uh, that makes your path a bit rougher as you go down the, the potential well. So this is what's happening. Okay, that's a picture you should keep in mind. And uh, I talked about Dif dif differential operators, well, the, the first uh, way in which differential operators appear in the study of diffusion, it's probably something that you all know, um, is that if you have a diffusion like this, um, then there are two pictures, right? Either you think about what this action on, on trajectories, on points, does on function. So you can say, okay, it generates a semi-group uh, on functions what is the generator of that semigroup? Or you ask, okay, I have particles moving around, what's happening to the probability density of finding X you know, in, in some neighborhood, okay? And in both cases, this operator appears, so epsilon the Laplacian plus minus grad B plus B dot the gradient, okay? And in the probability density uh, picture, what it says is that the variation in uh, the probability density follows a uh, drift diffusion equation. So the effect of the random term is that there's a diffusion term and the effect of uh, this, determin this deterministic part is just uh, that you're transported along minus nabla v plus b, okay? And uh, just a last remark on that operator, which plays a Q role uh, in the study of diffusions, is that sometimes it's more convenient to conjugate the original operator by e to the minus uh, v over 2 epsilon so that you can kill this term here, but then it reappears as a zeroth order term. Okay, so here I mean zeroth order term in, in derivative, right? This is the second order term in derivatives. This is the first order term. This is the zeroth order term. So sometimes you will see me talk about uh, this or about this, but really it doesn't matter because that conjugation preserves all the nice spectral properties that I'm interested in. And, and right, the assumptions, they're sort of made with, with the purpose that uh, this generator and actually a whole family of deformations of that operator have nice, uh, have nice properties. And what I mean by proper, nice properties is that, for example, uh, right, the domain is quite nice and it's a closed operator on LP. It generates a positive beauty preserving semigroup that uh, semigroup is compact, that semigroup is uh, holomorphic. So you really have access to a lot of tools from functional analysis and from the theory of semigroups. Okay, uh, so no, no th those are the tools and I'm trying to prove something about the large T properties of entropy production. But so far entropy production is just defined as the log of some Radon academic derivative, which is not necessarily easy to work with, okay? So I want to show you the result of a computation, not do the computation, but show you the result of the computation and explain why uh, it makes sense as a result, okay? So you can compute the log of the radon academic derivative that defines entropy production, and you find, uh, after some rearrangements, you find five terms. And I want to go line by line uh, through each term and tell you why it makes sense. So remember, I told you that entropy production uh, its sign was what you should look at to guess if gamma is an original movie or, or a reversed movie, okay? I said, if the entropy production is not negative, guess that the movie you are seeing is original, and if entropy production is negative, guess that it has been reversed, okay? So when is the first line non-negative? The first line is non-negative when, right, the log is monotonous, so uh, Right, the first line will be non-negative if this is at least this, meaning if gamma zero, sorry, the density of the initial condition 
in gamma zero is at least as big as the density of the initial condition at gamma t, meaning that gamma zero, the first frame in your movie, is at least as likely as an initial condition than the last frame. Okay, so indeed, it suggests that there's a good chance the, the, the movie was not reversed. When is the second line non-negative? Well, it's non-negative when uh, you go from, your curve goes from a point of a high potential to a point of low potential. Okay, meaning that in this movie that you're being shown, you indeed go down the potential well, which makes sense for an original movie. Okay. Now there's this last term. Um, and, and if you come from a physics background, you recognize this as the work done okay, by some non-conservative force on the particle. And it really should come as no surprise because of the intuition that uh, that comes from thermodynamics. So I call this thing entropy production, okay? So it has to have to do, you know, it has to have something to do with thermodynamic quantities, okay? So in thermodynamics, you usually define uh, this entropy in terms of inverse temperatures and changes in heat, okay? And now by the first law of thermodynamics, there's a relation between heat, change in internal energy and work done. And if you sort of now replace delta Q by uh, the infinitesimal heat exchange by the infinitesimal uh, change in V and, and the work and identify epsilon, so one over epsilon as an inverse temperature, then these two terms really what they are, are the heat divided by temperature. And now there's this term, which is a more um, model dependent, I guess, uh, feature of entropy production in that specific context, but, but that's a general trend, right? You, you define entropy production, you can define entropy production in several ways, but usually uh, the main contribution um, are the same and maybe there are some differences at the boundary, right? Why, why I say that this is the main contribution? Well, think for a second that you're on a compact space. Well, if you're on a compact space, then uh, this is bound and function and V is continuous. And, um, I should have said that before, I, I assume V is C3. Uh, so this is a continuous function. If the initial condition is nice, this is also a continuous function. So this stays bounded. So when you divide by T, it sort of goes away. Whereas this, if B is not a conservative field, has no reason to stay bounded as T goes to infinity. You actually uh, expect it to grow as T goes to infinity and uh, B of order T. Okay, so this is the main contribution in some sense. And for the rest of the talk, I will actually only work with that main contribution. So because of that, that argument with, with compactness and sort of the expectation that because my V grows, things essentially stay within a compact, uh, that's what most people do. They will just say they, they work with entropy production, but actually they work with this. Uh, so I will work with, with this also, but uh, I took the time to check as part of the paper, the, the sort of technical conditions that ensure that the whole thing has the same asymptotics as this, what I will call the main contributions. For the next uh, remainder of the talk, I'll talk about uh, the mean behavior and large deviation properties of this blue term. Okay. So now we have a better handle on what this is and I want to prove a large deviation principle. And so, uh, as I said before, Gartner Ellis suggests that I look at the moment generating function. Okay, so the two-sided Laplace transform um, but now this is not quite in a nice form, but there are standard probabilistic tools for massaging this expression and writing it in a form uh, to which you can now apply the Feynman cast formula. So the price to pay is that uh, you had to change the underlying diffusion. Okay, that, that's a common trick. Um, so now I have something that the that I can write as a PDE, but now the the second and first order part of the differential operator have changed a bit. Sorry, just, just the first order part has changed a bit, okay? So that tells me that my moment generating function, what roughly it is, is an integral of a solution to a PDE with uh, initial condition one, okay? So in, in, in a functional analytic language, I write it as the exponential T of an operator acting on a function and then integrated, okay? 
And now you expect this to either grow exponentially or decay exponentially, depending on the largest eigenvalue of the operator that is in the exponential. And now, of course, this operator, because of the deformation and because of that function, it depends on alpha, okay, which is a parameter for the moment generating function. So the moment generating function has to do with a PDE. And so to understand the large time behavior of the PDE, you try to understand the largest eigenvalue of the operator. Okay. And here I mean largest eigenvalue because, uh, because of my sign convention, there's no minus in front of the Laplacian. So this the Laplacian is non-negative. And so the, the top of its spectrum is what you sometimes call the bottom spectrum if you put the other side. Okay. So indeed, so, so this sort of rough idea can be made precise by studying the, the properties of that differential operator. And you can indeed show that the limit of the moment generating function, once you take the log and divide by d, it exists. It defines a smooth function, okay, at least for some alphas near 0 and 1, so, sorry, around the interval 0, 1. And now the gartner relis theorem tells you that if you take the Legendre transform of that eigenvalue, uh, then you get the large deviation principle with that Legendre transform as a rate function. Okay. And there's something that comes up during these computations, which, which I did not discover, uh, but which is too important to not mention. And it's this particular symmetry of the rate function, which is sometimes called the galavati cohen uh, symmetry. Okay, So I want to talk a bit about the large deviation principle and, and the, the, the kind of intuition that it gives you. Okay, So my large deviation principle, it tells me that if I'm looking at the value um, candidate value for entropy production, or the time average in entropy production, um, that's not too far from the mean. Uh, the probability that my average entropy production falls close to this, uh, to this value, it decays exponentially, and the rate of exponential decay is given by my rate function. Rate function gives the rate of exponential decay. Now, what the galavati cohen symmetry allows me to do is to compare this with the same thing with minus sigma. And it tells me that the probability that the time average entropy production is around minus sigma divided by the probability that it's about sigma. Okay, so the ratio of the probabilities is the ratio of their sort of exponential decay, okay, and the ratio of the right. You you use that the basic. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the, the ratio of the exponentials is the exponential of the difference. That's what I meant to say. And the sym symmetry that was on the last line, it tells you that this minus this is just sigma. Okay, and and that's deep, right? It tells you that the negative values of entropy production, okay, which is this important physical quantities, not only not only are they um, at a disadvantage when compared to positive values, but the ratio of the probabilities is universal. It does not depend on anything, right? This ratio of entropy production taking a certain value and entropy production taking the opposite value, this ratio does not depend on the parameter uh, in the models. It's always the same thing. Okay, so it's something that was observed in the mid 90s and the first sort of theoretical result also came in the mid and late 90s. Um, and it actually fueled a lot of interesting numerical, experimental, theoretical works about trying to understand understanding this sort of universality in the way entropy production fluctuates. Okay, so that's a, a big motivation actually for some of the work we're, we're doing. But as I said, um, uh, I've just proved that it also holds in, in this slightly more general context than the one in which it, it was already known. Okay, so this is my large deviation principle. I have a rate function named, and my rate function and the large deviation principle, uh, right, it exists, but so far it's just the leading eigenvalue of some second order differential operator, um, which is not in any way uh, an explicit quantity. Okay. So um, as I said, I, I've done this trick again where I removed the minus nabla v here and it, it appears here now. So now I want to understand the rate function, so the rate of fluctuations of entry production for very small noise. And uh, now because again, again of the Gartner-Ellis theorem, I know that all I need to do 
is understand the behavior of the moment generating function as L time goes to zero. And because of the Feynman cat's uh, result, I know that what I need to do is understand the smallest eigenvalue of a differential operator as epsilon goes to zero. Okay. But people have looked at things that, that look like that. Okay. This is a problem with a long history in semi classical analysis. So we'll take inspiration from that. Um, so let's imagine for a second that you have a, a smooth function, non negative, growing uh, at infinity. Now there's a, a very classical result that tells you that if this w attains zero in, in one and only one point, then the smallest eigenvalue of the co corresponding Schrodinger operator, okay, uh, here h bar is, is a physical constant, but you think of it as very small, um, at least as you approach the classical regime. Um, and so people have worked on expansions of the smallest eigenvalue of this operator uh, in h bar, okay, and they found that the smallest eigenvalue is h bar times uh, the trace of the square root of half the Hessian of the potential at the, at the global mean. Now there are different generalizations of this result. So one of which is well, instead of having one global min, assume you have two, right? Two points where the the potential attains zero. Uh, and that maybe you also have another potential that's lower order, so smaller in the sense that it has a h bar in front of it. Then you can still prove that the smallest eigenvalue of this admits an expansion in h bar. And the first term now is in, in this expansion is the min of the answers that you would get if you only add x1 or only add x2. Okay, And it's just given by the the smallest of the two traces of the Eschens. And so by induction, this goes to finitely many. Yeah, you can prove it for n. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can actually find higher order in h bar. Okay. okay. Thank this you. Is, this is a classical. Okay, but now here I'm in a bit of a different situation. Okay, so the first obvious difference, which is not bad at all, is that I have an epsilon here, which is small, then nothing here, and then one over epsilon. But if I multiply everything by epsilon and call epsilon h bar, maybe flip the sign, I'm in a very similar situation. The big difference being that I have a first order term. Okay. And this first order term, um, unless you're in a very special situation, makes the operator not self-adjoint. And so the methods that are proved, that are used to prove these results have to be adapted a bit. Okay. So one method that I know for proving this, for example, is uh, relies on the Rayleigh Ritz principle for the smallest eigenvalue. Okay, and here you have to adapt that because your operator is not self-adjoint. But there are other variational principles for non-self-adjoint uh, differential operators, and that's actually what I've used to prove the result that you expect. Meaning that the smallest eigenvalue, now it's not order epsilon anymore because right the scaling is different. It's order one, and it's the max. Now, not the min because the sign is flipped, but it's the max of the eigenvalues that you would obtain by uh, looking at the linearization of such operators. Okay, I mean linearization. You make this exactly. You make a quadratic approximation of this, and a linear approximation of this, and you compute the eigenvalue. Now, for um, operators like this, right, where this is a linear vector field and this is a, a quadratic potential. Uh, finding the smallest eigenvalue, right? It's it's not that bad because what you do is you guess that the smallest eigenvector is a Gaussian, and you sort of find an equation for the, the covariance matrix of the Gaussian. Okay, and so I was able to do that. It it takes some time, but but the intuition is clear. The intuition is the same as in the semi-classical analysis of Schrodinger operators. So now if the eigenvalue goes to the max over of a family of eigenvalues and my rate function is the Legendre transform of the eigenvalue, uh, then you just exploit the relation between taking max, taking Legendre transform and taking what is called the convex, convex hall or convex envelope, okay? So my theorem is that the limit Right, if you look at the rate function that you had before and take epsilon to zero, the limit exists for all sigma in some set, 
okay, not necessarily on the whole real line, and can be computed as the convex hull of the rate functions that you would get in the linearized problem, which we know have uh, almost explicit formulas because of previous works that were done for the linear case. Okay, And now all of this is actually the first time where I can, I can answer my very first question of the presentation, which is, is the game easy in the context of non-determinate diffusion? Well, all I can say is that under the assumptions that I've been working with, the game is easy for small enough epsilon unless the Jacobian of B is symmetric in each uh, of the local min of V, okay? So all that to, to sort of barely answer my, my most basic questions, okay? But of course, I get more information uh, about the large deviations and, and everything, but uh, it took quite a while just to answer, you know, the question in the limit, is the game still easy? And so the summary is that uh, large deviation properties of entropy production, they allow you um, to answer many questions on the so-called hypothesis testing of the arrow of time. So I've looked at, at that in the context of non-degenerate diffusion. And I told you that if you want to understand the rate of exponential suppression of fluctuations of entropy production, what you should do is look at the different critical points of V, okay? Linearize the SDE there, essentially, uh, solve a matrix equation involving the Hessian of V at XJ, the Jacobian of B at XJ, and the parameter alpha. Okay, there's a way to write down, it's, it's, there's a canon, canonical way of writing an equation, which is, which is essentially the consequence of making a Gaussian ansatz in, in what I was talking about. Okay, then you take the trace of that solution to the equation, uh, you take the Legendre transform, and that gives you a very good approximation of the rate function when epsilon is very small. Right, you have to, because there are many, you have to take the convex, convex envelope, okay? So um, in, in picture, right, you have the system uh, where you go down the potential uh, landscape, you're deviated by B, you're subject to some noise. You go to each local min, you compute the solution, uh, the trace of the solution to some matrix equation that's parameterized by alpha, you get curves. Now there are two things you can do. Either you take the max of the two curves, which is this, that's plot here, and then take the Legendre transform, or you take the Legendre transform of each, right? The Legendre transform of the orange line would be the orange line that's here. It's a bit faint. Maybe you see it. You do the same for the blue curve, giving you this. And then you take the convex envelope of the two curves, meaning the curve that sort of envelopes both curves from below. So something like this. So it, it, in the end, it's a it's a very simple strategy. Okay, once you know all of this, it's just looking at the equation, linearizing, solving matrix equations, and taking the genre, playing with basic properties of the genre transforms. Uh, so here are, are the references. Uh, if you want to read the the original paper of Galvet Cohen that sort of started this interest in the large deviation properties of entropy production, right before. I guess the, the intuition from hypothesis testing, it was this sort of symmetry that sparked the interest in the large deviation principle uh, for entropy production and then other relevant works in, in the literature. So uh, I'm going to stop here. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, are there any questions? No, so I wanted to ask one uh, question, which is maybe a little bit different from uh, uh, the exact thing you are doing. But uh, in, in classical mechanics, there are these uh, people study billiards, right? So you go to the boundary and then you reflect. Uh, but sometimes uh, in, in actual physical system, there are examples where a part of the energy is reflected and part of it is refracted, right? And so sometimes this is called like branching billiards uh, or, uh, but, but they come in uh, if you have like a semiconductor or like two materials with a common boundary, things like that. Mm 
-hmm. And uh, so there are many physical examples. And so uh, what people studied a lot is kind of classical uh, billiard dynamics where you keep being inside the domain and re always reflect. Uh, but in, in this branching thing, uh, then there is kind of mixing because you, uh, you can sort of have, a, I don't know, a toy system where you have two domains and some sort of jump discontinuity along the boundary and you reflect and refract and then the, the two things go again, reach the common boundary and branch again and so on. So there pr probably should be some sort of entropy production in that uh, thing. So, so it seems that like the, the, if you evolve forward in time, you have more branching than if you evolve uh, backward. So we, uh, we played a little bit uh, proving, you know, uh, a theorem a la Sachs-Nerlman's theorem about uniform distribution of eigenfunctions uh, for such systems. But I think uh, maybe the entropy production for such things could be interesting to, to look at, but uh, I don't know. This is just a, something maybe we could discuss further. Yeah, so, so as you said, when you go one way in time or the other, there's a clear difference between the two, right? Uh, in one way, you get more and more branches, and in the other, you get less and less. So the, the, the hypothesis testing aspect, I guess, is a bit trivial, no? But uh, there might be a way to at least to work around well, that. Or, I guess or can branches merge? Or? Uh, I guess the question, like quantifying uh, the, the, this thing, I, I suppose, yeah, I, I don't know. I'll, um, I'll send you some reference. Cool. Uh, are there other questions? Well, uh, if not, uh, let's uh, thank Renault once again. And uh, thank you very much for coming to this last talk, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to the last seminar in the Fall semester and uh, well, stay safe, happy holidays, uh, and uh, well, we shall resume in uh, January, probably on January fifteenth, tent tentatively. Uh, we'll uh, we'll send announcements. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Thanks. 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 Th